Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews with NP Strategy here in the studio today with Matthew Roberts, Next Improved Healthcare Attorney. Matthew, good to be with you. Good to see you. And we want to welcome back Josh Arant, one of the founding members of Mako Medical Laboratories, a national diagnostics lab that served in a major role across the U.S. during the height of COVID. Josh, thank you for joining us for what is now time number three. Of course. Thanks for having me. Look forward to be on them. I understand just from uh, talking with some of your colleagues that there's been an increase in flu and RSV positivity around the country. Can you give us your thoughts on this along with any thoughts on a possible COVID variant? Sure. Yeah, we, we've seen over the past several months where, and I'm sure we've all read, where um, flu positivity rates and then RSV in kids has increased uh, significantly. Um, you know, COVID the past two winters has been the main story, um, but now flu uh, positivity rates continue to increase and in, in RSV as well. So um, we're here to test and try to figure out and diagnose uh, those things for, for the patients. Um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing that increase occur. Um, really tough to pin down on why that that is. Um, if it's just, you know, these strains are stronger than the current uh, COVID strain, and that's what people are catching or, or what that may be. But uh, we are seeing that data as everyone's reading about it in the news. Josh, how do you stay on top of, of these changes, not only with COVID, but with, with, you know, this unexpected increase in flu and RSV? You guys are always on the cutting edge. How, how do you do that? Yeah, you kind of go, it's very cyclical. So you kind of understand and look at the data from previous cycles um, and try to plan and prepare uh, for an upcoming cycle. Um, you know, with COVID specifically, we've been in this Omicron variant, subvariant now for almost a year. And, um, you know, we've seen kind of the volumes increase significantly in the very beginning of 2022 and then it's been pretty steady decline over the course of 2022 and into 2023 um, regarding flu you know the fortunate thing about being a diagnostic laboratory is you get to see those results really quickly so as patients come in uh, for with flu-like symptoms and rsv type symptoms um, and we test we start to see the increases in the positivity rates uh, firsthand so that allows us to prepare uh, rather quickly and we've got great supply chain partners that um, are able to continue to keep us um, stocked with the necessary inventory and, and supplies to keep continue to run those tests. Right. Mako is a significant employer uh, and we know in the healthcare industry there have been all kinds of workforce challenges and shortages. What is your team doing to try to address or overcome those challenges? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, it starts with culture. Um, and do people really want to come work for you and your team and your leadership and um, the company and what they represent? So we spend a lot of time uh, on focusing on our culture and ensuring that it's a place where people want to work. Um, it's also a place where people get better, not only professionally, but personally. And so I think that's for us where it starts. And then uh, secondarily is how do you skill upskill folks uh, while they're in your organization so they can uh, take that next step in their professional career. So we've got several programs that we've been working on now for a couple of years and are launching uh, at the end of last year and early this year uh, that allows folks who come and begin working at MAKO um, to gain new skills that make them more valuable, not only MAKO, uh, but further in their career. Well, that's a great idea. I mean, it, and you linked it back to culture. I think, you know, you're improving your workforce and, and helping employees at the same time. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on with your phlebotomy program? Yeah, so that was one of the first things that we saw as a difficulty in just finding uh, qualified phlebotomists um, across the country with all of our clients. And so um, we, we said, hey, let's, let's start our own program. So we went through the entire accreditation process uh, with ASCP uh, to become a formal um, phlebotomy program. So now Macon University has an ASCP accredited program for phlebotomists. So it's a nine-week course where we can take an individual, um, they get 100 draws through that course, and afterwards um, they have the opportunity to then become an accredited uh, phlebotomist uh, through the Mako course. So um, it's another way to, to make 
have individuals upskill and also um, create more value for the organization. And that's free for your employees. Is that correct? It is free for our team. That's that's absolutely correct. So wow. they, they get to benefit from that. It's it's their choice. Um, all that we ask is if they commit and they see it all the way through. Mm-hmm. Will you expand beyond internal? Yes. Our plan in 2023 is to expand it to the public. Um, so again, we can continue to create a pipeline across the country of not only of phlebotomists in this specific program um, that can service our clients um, and our growing number of clients uh, throughout the country. So th- that's interesting because the workforce shortage has been a problem in healthcare, and you're solving the problem by creating your own education slash training programs. Uh, and you know that's unique. I know hospitals have tried to do this by funding nursing programs and others, but you've taken the bull more by the horns to to create these additional potential employees, which is fantastic. We've tried, you know, it's we've tried the traditional route where we try to recruit and then, you know, you really just get into um, these wage wars that, that are occurring and um, it's just simply not sustainable. So um, how can we upskill our team so they can become more valuable uh, for the long term in their professional career? You've got some highly skilled people within your organization. What what could you do beyond phlebotomy? You've got everybody, you know, from A to Z in your in your org. That's a, that's a great question. So uh, another um, subset of uh, team members of ours that you know, from a labs perspective, not only for commercial reference laboratories but for hospital laboratories, um, finding uh, medical lab technicians and medical lab technologists and medical technologists has been. Um, has been very difficult. So uh, we are we are looking and building that plan right now to provide online programs where um, they can kind of have an apprenticeship and internship at one of our laboratories across the country. And then they can then get, we would pay for that online program. And so that they can, can get upskilled um, because many labs have regulatory requirements, whether it's through CLIA or CAP, where we have to have MLTs or MTs um, or medical laboratory scientists with certain degrees and uh, crediting criteria in order to run our laboratory compliantly. So, um, yes, we are we're building these programs so we can upskill our team, but it's also to maintain compliance with all of our accrediting organizations. Well, what's next for Mako Medical? You've you've grown so fast and you've responded to the global challenge created by COVID nineteen. We're an integral part uh, of the national testing strategy. What's next for you guys? Yeah, that's the big question. What's the great pivot out of COVID? Right. So, um, a couple of things. We are, um, we've aggressively expanded our sales force um, in our core markets that, uh, that we are currently in, um, not only before the pandemic, but now in the pandemic. So, so that's something we create a sales training program um, last year. That's about a 16 week course that people come out um, and they know everything about Mako and lab and um, how to present our value proposition. Um, secondly, uh, we are strategically looking at acquisitions um, across the country and evaluating those in markets that we may not be in, but we may want to be in that are growing markets. And so that is a part of our growth strategy out of COVID. And then finally, we're looking at new delivery models that we've kind of learned through the COVID pandemic on uh, how patients want their lab services delivered. Um, how can we be more patient friendly? So. Um, A program that we're launching um, in Q1 is called Mako to You, and it's a new patient delivery model. Um, You know, all of us got really used to utilizing DoorDash or Uber Eats or or some other uh, food delivery program, Um, and it was all done on your app. And uh, it was the same food. It was just delivered to you. So we were trying to take that concept and bring it to the lab space where, um, you know, patients didn't have to go to a patient service center or maybe it's a smaller doctor's office and they don't have room to have an in-office phlebotomist or someone to collect those specimens. Uh, They could simply get on our application, um, choose a designated address and a designated time, and our team would go to um, that location and perform the laboratory draw. Um, and then bring that those specimens back to our laboratory and report the results through the application. So that's kind of phase one. Um, phase two is to kind of create a little lab in a van type concept where we can provide point of care testing uh, on routine tests that would occur right there in someone's parking lot or driveway. So they get the results back in 30 minutes or less. And so they're not waiting for that 24 hours uh, to get those results. So we're just trying to look at different 
um, ways to deliver results and to deliver lab services to patients and kind of expand upon the telehealth um, kind of trajectory that, that kind of occurred during the pandemic. You know, one of the things that with the, the growth or explosion of telehealth was the payers covered it. Uh, and now we see a little bit of uh, reluctance on some payers to continue to cover the expansion of telehealth and certain direct to patient initiatives or, or treating patients where they where they are. Have you experienced any of that? Do you anticipate that the payers will draw back any in terms of their coverage of testing? It's obviously testing is an incredibly important part of maintaining the health and wellness uh, of, of our country. Um, but what are you seeing uh, now with the payers on that front? Yeah. So from the telehealth standpoint, I think in the very beginning of the pandemic, you kind of saw a lot of the, the traditional rules uh, from a payer standpoint and from a regulatory standpoint um, kind of be relaxed in order to just have all hands on deck and service as many patients as possible. I think now what you're seeing is that people are evaluating how that worked. And if they didn't feel like they're getting as much value as they were paying for, then they're pulling some of that back. So it's really on the medical providers like Mako and others to prove that value to the payers that say, mm -hmm. hey, this is what you were paying for and here's the value that you're getting for it. Um, and, and don't retract those payer policies, but actually expand them so more patients can be covered. So I think the onus is on us to work in partnership with payers to prove that there is value in those services and there is reason for those to be paid. Are there other regulatory challenges with, with a shift in healthcare like this? I, I, there are. I mean, there are extensive regulatory frameworks that deal with how you can market and sell certain services, including lab services. And what's always a problem is the technology and innovation is getting ahead of the regulatory framework. So the regulatory framework as it exists now is designed for to address when people go to the doctor and get services, et cetera. It's not really designed for when the care is, is brought to the patient at home. So it's, we're trying to, to deal with sometimes apples and oranges and, and doing these regulatory analysis. But they're, you know, it's, it's the most regulated business on the planet, healthcare. So as Josh well knows. Yes. And for, in a lot of respects, for good reason, right? Where, you know, you're, you're giving somebody health information that kind of derives the way they should live their life or, or not live their life. So uh, there needs to be a healthy balance there. If we could, Josh, let's end on just a little bit of talk about MAKO internally and externally. Internally, I'm aware of your program, MAKO Cares. And then externally, I've, you know, been calling it once I heard about it, the Mako Miracle, but um, you did some really nice things around the holidays that were uh, beyond what maybe some companies would normally do. So if you would talk about both things, Mako Cares internally focused and then what your external focus has been. Yeah, so Mako Cares was originated prior to the pandemic and that was really originally um, brought up to us from our team. They said, hey, we love the fact that how much MAKO gives externally and how much they have an impact externally to other organizations. Uh, but there are people inside of our company that need the same type of care um, and same type of resources, um, whether it's through a hard time they're going through or a family emergency or just a life emergency. And so we developed a, a program called MAKO Cares where um, our team can then submit um, relief, whether that's financial or other types, and uh, we step in uh, and take care of that. We also provide um, ongoing, not our team, but we connect them with ongoing counseling, whether it's financial or um, psychological or other types of counseling. So it's not just a one-time occurrence, but it's a long-term impact for that team. And, um, you know, all of our team has the ability to invest in MAKO Cares Fund. So that fund continues to grow and grow and grow. And then MAKO corporately continues to invest and in, in fund that. So the MAKO Cares program has been awesome because it really creates that family atmosphere among our entire team because you never know what somebody's going through. And um, just seeing, you know, we've had people who've lost their homes due to fires and our team has kind of stepped up and, um, and brought them through the, the, those hard times, which is really cool to see. Um, how our whole team kind of rallies around uh, one another. Uh, the second thing was um, each Christmas that we've tried to do, um, make a miracle toy drive, uh, whatever it may be called, um, <clears throat> and where we provide and partner alongside iHeartRadio 
Uh, we provide uh, up to $25,000 worth of toys to families in need across the triangle. Um, they are selected based upon need, um, sometimes in, in underserved, underserved areas. So that's really cool to see and just enlighten people for families who may not have had a great Christmas um, or didn't have anything planned that we were able to step in um, and do that in partnership with iHeartRadio. And this is our second year partnering alongside Vance, Vance County Schools. Um, and we approached them and said, hey, what are two of your uh, most underserved elementary schools? Um, and we'd like to do a surprise toy drive. Our team just came up with this idea. And so uh, they picked two schools, 270 students, uh, pre-K through fifth grade. Um, and each one of those students got a really nice gift. And uh, we put a $20 minimum on that for our team. Um, so it was things like scooters and science sets and, and Nerf toys and Lego sets. And so it was a complete surprise. Um, the, the administrators and the staff also got $50 Amazon gift cards. Um, and then we helped replace a large majority of the computer monitors in each one of those schools. So it was just wow. a way for our team to give back. You asked, how are we, how are we recruiting? It's about the culture, right? So it starts and ends with that. And this is part of our culture. We want to be, um, good stewards of what we've been blessed with and also, you know, provide others and pass that along. So and, and uh, Matthew, if you haven't seen it, there's a little video of these kids getting the, uh, it, it's just extravagant generosity, yeah. you know, in overdrive. It's really special. I if bet. You seen that online. That's terrific. The special thing is that a lot of these programs, they're not coming from me. They're not coming from Chad. They're not coming from other leadership. They're coming from inside of our organization where people are saying, hey, we know this is the fundamental DNA of MAKO. Here's an opportunity to serve. Um, and we get we get behind them, so it's really good to see that it's not just top level driven down. Wow. Um, actually, throughout our entire organization, wow, it does set you apart. Josh, thank you for uh, you for joining us today. Number one for the third time, um, but also for your team's good work both during the pandemic and um, you know even now, whether it's diagnostic work yeah. or work in the community, it's it's great to see your company continue to shine. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. For those of you who joined us today, we hope you learned a little bit more about Mako Medical and some of the things they have going on. On behalf of Matthew and the entire team here at Taking the Pulse, we wish you the best in 2023. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again right here on Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast. <music>